By the middle of the 19th century, the population of London had begun to increase dramatically. With this increase came the need for a vastly improved sewage system. At the time, all London sewage was discharged straight into the Thames from wherever the sewage tunnels happened to emerge. The situation was improved when most of the sewage was intercepted and diverted downstream away from London. But these interceptor sewers were still not large enough to handle the volume. The problem was particularly acute in wet weather, when some low-lying areas of London began flooding with sewage, an unpleasant and dangerous health hazard. Storm relief sewers were constructed so that the normal sewers could be relieved in wet weather and the excess water fed by gravity wherever possible into the Thames. In the low-lying areas like this one near Tower Bridge, the storm relief water had to be lifted before being discharged into the river. In 1906, the then London County Council opened the Shad Thames pumping station right here. Its job was to clear storm sewage from the centre and south of the city. And still today, in stormy weather between April and September, it can lift diluted storm sewage 20 feet before discharging it into the Thames just a few yards away. It's not the only pumping station on the river, but it is unique because inside, still in full working order, are six of the rarest operational engines in the country. A staff of eight keep these six three-cylinder vertical enclosed engines in full operational order. Basically, these are massive four-stroke internal combustion engines. But what makes them unique, apart from their age, is their fuel, North Sea gas. We'll look at these engines in more detail in a moment, but let's see first how the overall storm pumping system in the station works. Storm sewage flows over a weir in the main sewer into the penstock chamber, then through a gate into three wells beneath the pumps themselves. This indicator board shows the level of water in the wells below. When the four foot mark is reached, this pointer triggers an electronic switch which starts an alarm buzzer. From that sounding, the motors can be started within minutes. But first, there's a lot of work to be done. For the start-up procedure to take place, two operators are needed to get both the main pumps and the auxiliary equipment going, the pump primed and the engine running up to speed. The top man and the bottom man. Installed at the same time as the main gas engines, the auxiliary equipment, which provides hydraulic power around the station, is equally interesting to industrial archaeologists like Dr. Robert Carr. The accumulator is a means of storing water at high pressure to provide hydraulic power. This is just um, a, a large cylinder with a heavy weight on top, which keeps the water at something like 700 pounds per square inch. There's a small um, three-throw pump close by, driven by this small gas engine, and uh, this will pump the accumulator up and provide a store of power for later use. The initial starting power for the engines is compressed air. Once they're turning over, the gas mixture is passed into the cylinders and the engine starts to fire. Well, certainly machinery of this date runs at quite a slow speed and it has a sort of human feel about it in that the uh, the noises that it makes are relatively related to the human heartbeat, whereas if you get more modern high-speed engines, say a high-speed diesel, uh, modern ones run at such a speed that uh, <coughs> you only get a continuous note, you don't get the, um, a beat that you would get from machinery of this day. Um, I suppose this is rather like listening to a steam engine. Railway engines are very popular. Um, machinery of this day has a similar kind of feel because it runs fairly slowly.
Recently overhauled by the local motorcycle repair shop, rotary magnetos on the top of each engine supply the spark for combustion to these huge spark plugs. They're obsolete now, of course, and have to be sandblasted and overhauled when necessary. You couldn't buy a packet of these at your local Holfords. Well, with an engine of this size, you get, as you can imagine, enormous heat. The coolant is water. It's recycled water, a totally closed system, but not a particularly efficient one. For despite their huge size, the cooling area of these towers is quite small, effectively just the top surface layer. So additional cold water is now piped in from the mains at times of excessive demand. These nine-foot diameter, seven-ton flywheels keep the momentum up to the engines, helping them maintain an overall speed of 200 RPM. And that's driving these pumps at a massive overall rate of 100,000 gallons per minute through this station. After more than 70 years of operation, the need for higher efficiency and lower manning levels means that these massive gas engines will have to go. Well, basically, we're going to replace two engines at a time with uh, electric pumps and motors. Uh, eventually, the whole six are going to be done. There are plans for three of them to go to uh, historical museums. Uh, the rest, unfortunately, will be scrapped.